Eve, and this morning on our Life Weekly Call, I have Roger Hofer, who is a Chief Underwriter at North American Companies with us, and he's going to tell us uh, what to expect once you've got that case written, uh, once it gets to underwriting, what you can expect. Uh, Brandon Borgstahl with North American Companies, who's a Sales Development Specialist, is also with us. Um, Roger, go ahead and take it away. Well, hello, uh, Roger Hofer, uh, Underwriting Manager, and I run the North American Underwriting Department. So glad to talk with you here today. Uh, I'll kind of go over what to expect a little bit with uh, once an application hits, hits our office, and then also a list of very common impairments. This is a list of, of, uh, of different health items that we come across on a routine basis and also spur a lot of different questions. So I'll give you a little our, you know, my take on those different impairments of, of what you can expect and some things to watch out for and, and look at when you're field underwriting a case. We, you know, underwriting really begins uh, with you in the field uh, getting that information. The more information, the more accurate information that you can obtain directly from that applicant really does speed along the underwriting process. If, if, if you don't for, remember, if you forget everything else, but just remember that you guys' information is, is critical to that, to set the tone for that case, that's what I really want you to, to, to take away. So uh, that, that helps a lot. Uh, when a case comes into the, the home office, uh, you have an assigned underwriter. Now this underwriter will be seeing most of your business uh, and they'll be your main contact. The reason I say most of your business is sometimes underwriters got to take a day off. Every once in a while I let one do that, believe it or not. And so if they're out of the office or by chance, they just happened uh, the way the mail comes in. They just got uh, too much work for that particular day. We all work together uh, as a, a very large team to help keep that business flowing. Uh, time service and being responsive to you guys' needs is, is very important. So we need to, you know, help each other to 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 accomplish that. So the underwriter is going to uh, once that case is is brought into the system, the underwriter is going to do the initial review. Uh, usually within a couple of days of when it's coded into the system. Uh, at, at that point, everything is, is there that's available for them. We're in a 100% imaged environment. Everything comes to us basically electronically or we convert it into electronic data uh, immediately when it hits the home office. So if we get our, our, our APSs, our personal history interviews, uh, exams, uh, all those kind of items come to us electronically and we keep them electronic applications as soon as we get those if it's uh, not in electronic form we get it in, in that form so the underwriter is going to do that initial review and the other item is we're going to take a look at each piece of, uh, piece of mail as it comes into the office we don't wait till the very end till everything's here uh, if a, a lab comes in we're going to look at it uh, when the exam EKG comes in often with the lab but not always uh, we're going to take a look at that data we're going to line up the case uh, keep the underwriting uh, going forward, identify any new concerns, or basically uh, note the file that there isn't any concerns, whatever the case may be. So we're going to be looking at those items uh, along the way. Hey, now Roger, with uh, North American, we really have a, a two-step uh, approval process. We have Roger, the, can I stop you for one second? Sure. That is really great information to have of how you actually look at information as it comes in. Because we get agents all the time that will say, why don't they just ask me everything at one time? So to know that you look at it as it's new information coming in, even if it's on a daily basis, you're not going to wait until you have everything on that case. That's really great to know. Right. Our, our, our philosophy is address the issue as soon as it uh, occurs. Now, sometimes things pop up later in the underwriting that we didn't know. For example, you take a look at the application and there's no history. Well, if the exam comes in and, and they say they had a history of cancer, well, uh, we're going to have to address it at that time. Uh, or let's say there's something that pops up uh, uh, non-medical too, uh, later, later uh, found in medical records or something. You, we, looking at a case, everything looked fine. You got the guy's medical records in because he's diabetic, and all of a sudden you find out he was. Uh, had a, a, an aviation physical two years ago. Well, if we would have known it earlier, we would have addressed it. 
uh, now we know about it, so we'll have to move forward. So our, our philosophy is, you know, get identify any of the risk factors or things that really need to get looked at uh, as early as possible. Get them out there so we can deal with them uh, quick and easily. And All that's right, why I think that the, the agent, you know, the underwriting starts with the agent and, and getting that accurate information on the application uh, is, is, is critical and sets the tone for the case. You wouldn't be, you'd be shocked at the number of applications that we get in that are clean sheeted, meaning that all those answers on the, all those health questions, all those non-medical questions are just marked no. You get the exam in and they've got to use extra sheet of paper to get all the information down. Well, it doesn't look that great to an underwriter when all these questions are marked no, and, and then you get all this history. Uh, you know, I do recommend that even if an exam is being completed, that you do do the health questions, because if that, if we, if we find out information on that application that's important, we're going to order that APS right up the fr off the front. So if you if these guys got a history of cancer, uh, insulin dependent diabetes. Uh, you know, heart disease, stroke, those kind of things. We don't have to wait until the exam gets here to know about it. We can get that APS ordered as, as quick as possible. As you guys know, as you guys know, APS would take a long time to get. As much as we'd like to get them uh, quicker, uh, right now there's not a whole lot of alternatives other than to use, you know, one of the most aggressive vendors out there, uh, Pyramids.com. And while they do do a great job of getting the medical records. If we can avoid the medical records or just get them at least ordered at the beginning of the underwriting process, that just, just speeds along the, the, the whole uh, underwriting of the case. So once we, uh, once we do make an underwriting decision, uh, well, let me back up. We were talking about the two-part approval process. In, in a nutshell, the underwriter is going to approve the case from an underwriting standpoint but there might or might not be still administrative items needed before we can issue a case. So we're going to underwrite it. New business is going to look at the administrative items, and there's really two, two separate paths there. They might need a form. They might need uh, an, an item that, frankly, isn't, isn't an underwriting item, isn't going to in, impact the decision, nor do I want to uh, you know, delay the underwriting of the case because of it. So the underwriter is going to go ahead and uh, look at the case, divide, decide the premium class, make the offer. He's going to come back, uh, relay that information over to new business, and new business would then finish up uh, with any administrative items that are needed. This process, you know, works well for us. Get it out of the underwriter's hands. Back to you guys. This way here, you know what the offer is subject to any of the uh, outstanding administrative items. Those are always easier to. The, the, the pick up and sometimes people like to wait on a few of those items until till the underwriting is is done and, and that's fine but I just want to point out that it's really the the two-step underwriting process two steps to, to before we can get the case out to you great so Roger one of those might possibly be um, you as an underwriter don't necessarily care about an illustration that right. might be an administrative piece that needs to be taken care of after you make an offer. Right. Uh, you know, the illustration, you know, especially if this is a larger cash value product, I, we do want you to send that in right away because sometimes what the underwriter does like take a look at it. But there could be disclosure forms. There could be a whole host of uh, new business items that don't impact the actual underwriting decision of it. It's obviously needed for state regulations and other reasons. but. We don't want to hold the uh, underwriting decision. This way here we can tell you right up front, hey, this case is a standard uh, non-tobacco rates and, and why it's standard. And this way here then you can go back to your client and, and get any of the uh, non-medical or I should say, I should say non-underwriting type forms or questions or what, whatever it may be. Uh, then you know the decision. Great, thank you. Uh, Brent, Brandon had given me a, a list of items of different health and health concerns uh, that we'll discuss a little bit here. 
I'll give you my take on them uh, of how North American treats them and a little bit of our underwriting philosophy uh, regarding it. Uh, the first one up on the list is marijuana. Has, has there been a whole lot of things in the more interesting to read in the newspapers and see on TV than about the changes in marijuana uh, in, the, in the different states. Uh, even here in South Dakota, they're trying to get it legalized on the Indian reservations. I think since more and more states have uh, made it legal or medically legal within their states, we definitely see a lot more questions about that. And companies all treat it differently. Yeah, it, it is. It's. Um, and, and our take, I think, is pretty reasonable on it. Uh, I'm going to divide this into a few, a couple of different groups, actually. Uh, the first one is people that are actually in the industry. We're talking about people that are, are, are selling it, um, that are the financial backers of it, own the businesses. Those we're actually unable to consider. So if they're associated with the, the, the manufacturing, sales, or distribution of the marijuana, we're going to be unable to uh, uh, offer coverage on that. Now that's obviously a very small amount of, of the population. Uh, these are the people that are you know, owning the stores and growing it and things. Uh, there's, there's you know, still against the federal law. Uh, with our anti-money laundering, there, that's a, a big gray area. So uh, at the advice of our legal and compliance department, that group uh, of we're, we're just not able to offer. We've also been put on notice by our reinsurers that they don't want to be auto-bound on, on, on that particular uh, situation. Now, granted, that's a very small number of, of people. The, the vast majority, of course, are, are those that are, are just using marijuana for uh, recreational purposes or uh, medically. Uh, medicinal purposes there. You know, if they're taking it for medical reasons, we're going to take it and see how much they're using and then also why they're using it. Uh, the fact that they're using it maybe is the, the small issue. Uh, maybe they're using it because to treat their MS or depression or glaucoma or honestly a whole host of medical reasons. So if they're taking it for medical reasons, we're going to defer back to why they're taking it. I think that makes sense. It's, it can be an effective treatment for certain things. Um, sometimes it's used uh, for, for conditions that I'm not so sure it always helps, but uh, you know, it, it, it depends on the effectiveness. You know, that's, a, that's my, just my personal opinion. You see a lot of uh, marijuana being used medically for reasons that don't always make that much sense. Uh, so that we also take a look at how much they're using. Uh, you know, if they're using it for recreational purposes, it, it's critical to get a, 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 an alcohol or a, a, a drug use questionnaire so we know exactly how often they're using it and, and to the best of their ability, how much. That's always a little bit subjective since marijuana different types are have a, a significantly different levels of uh, uh, active ingredient, THC, if I remember right. There, you know, if somebody is using uh, marijuana on a daily basis, we're probably going to pass on them. Uh, the mortality is probably similar to somebody that gets uh, a little intoxicated. So if they're, you know, if somebody was taking alcohol, if they're intoxicated every day, we'd pass on them. Uh, if someone is, you know, smoking marijuana, you know, once or twice a week has a, has a little bit of marijuana once or twice a week. That's someone we can still probably offer on. Often, if it's going to be uh, smoked, we're going to go with smoker rates. Marijuana is actually much more carcinogenic than, than cigarettes, even. So we, if they're uh, smoking it or inhaling it, we will go with uh, tobacco rates. Now, if you come across somebody that is ingesting it, uh, we would still potentially go non-tobacco rates. The key there is, is, is how much they're using. Uh, and then also what all these social, occupational, and other risk factors about the applicant. A, for example, we might treat a 19-year-old dishwasher that makes $10,000 a year 
quite different than somebody that is a, a, a CPA that uses the same amount, the 50-year-old CPA that's married and has uh, three kids and, and has a similar, you know, uses marijuana once or twice a week. They might get to quite different uh, underwriting, and I think that makes sense. Diabetes. Uh, diabetes, you know, the key factors there, of course, are going to be how old the applicant is when it was diagnosed, how, uh, what type of treatment they're on, uh, oral medications, diet, and the biggest item, obviously, is the control level. If, uh, if it's under good control, they're going to get the best rate. If it's not under control, it's going to be higher and maybe even declined. Also, we'll look very closely to see what, uh, if any, other medical, medical concerns have popped up uh, because of the diabetes. For example, neuropathy, uh, nephropathy, or any other complications uh, from the diabetes. You see that uh, more, more often with uh, older people of long-term di uh, duration of diabetes, or if they don't have it under very good control. On the surface, that's a tough one for you guys to uh, really field underwrite because I've never, in my, in, in my 20, uh, close to 28 years of underwriting, I've, I've never seen a diabetic tell me it's not under good, good control. Either they say they don't give a control level or they say it's under good control. And there's not, uh, no, no one ever says it's not, or they're not following what their doctor says. Exactly. So guys, and how does, how does North American look at um, somebody who maybe marks on their um, application that their doctor has said they are pre-diabetic, but they're not taking any medication yet. Yeah. Well, there we're, we're actually going to uh, look more so at the, the blood sugar levels and the A1C levels. The, the glycohemoglobin or A1C levels is really the number that the underwriter is going to key on. Uh, we get both test results with on our blood test panel, and, and that's what the doctor is going to be doing to, you know, on the patient to, to, to monitor the control and see where it's at. So regardless of what the, 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 the label is by the doctor, we're going to take a look and see how effective the diet is or the, or the medication. I have cases that are declined, you know, if they're on a diet, uh, uh, oral medications are on insulin and also approved uh, on all those kind of treatments. It, it really depends on the, the control level there. So basically, even if, you know, just to clarify, if your client is taking insulin, it's not a definite knockout. It's going to depend on right. the whole picture. Right. Not just uh, you know, on insulin, there's going to be some degree of rating. You know, you want insulin, or excuse me, you want diabetes to show itself in late in life as possible. Uh, the biggest risk are those younger juvenile diabetics because they have such a long life expectancy ahead of them. A, a, a five-year-old that de that uh, that has uh, insulin-dependent diabetes, you know, his normal life expectancy might be out there 75, 80 years at that point. You have a 70-year-old that just develops diabetes. Uh, at that age, but he always had normal blood sugars before, you know, his standard life expectancy is maybe only 15, 16 years. So with diabetes, uh, the, 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 the concern isn't that the person is going to go diabetic catatonic, it's what the damage that the diabetes does to your, to your heart, to your uh, nervous system, to, to your brain for that matter. So the, the problem with diabetes, they, people never really die of diabetes. They die of the complications that diabetes causes. And when it's found later in life, that's, that's the better situation because they're likely, not to be too blunt, but they're likely of dying of, of other things other than diabetes. Right. So how that, That's why you see high, high rates on younger ages and lower rates on, on, on higher ages. Some doctors feel that, hey, if you live long enough, everyone's going to de uh, develop diabetes eventually. It seems to be the case. That is for sure. It, it sure is. Once you start hitting into that late 70s and 80s, 
the amount that are diabetic or, or as doctors like to say, uh, pre-diabetes or glucose intolerant is, is incredibly, incredibly high. Great. Thanks, Roger, for that clarification. Yep. So with uh, diabetes, you know, really ranges all the way from a, a standard to, uh, to a decline, depending on those factors. Uh, the key numbers we look at is, is, like I said, the A1C, and if we can start getting A1Cs consistently in that normal range, those are the ones that uh, have a good chance of, of going standard with us. Uh, cholesterol. Cholesterol, what I'm concerned about there is how effective their medication is, or diet, or whatever they've done to treat it, I, I'm concerned only about how effective it is. If their cholesterol levels meet our preferred or super preferred criteria, even if they're on medication, they can still be in, in those classes. So with diabetes, or excuse me, with a cholesterol, the key factor there is, is, is what those blood tests look at. It's, it's hard to raise and lower your cholesterol significantly without medication. And right now, the medications that you're on for cholesterol are pretty straightforward and, uh, and effective with minimal, if any, uh, uh, adverse side effects and no, no real serious side effects with them. So that's why if, they, uh, if the medication's working well, they can be even into that super preferred rates. Pregnancy. The key factor there for us is that they haven't had any complications. If they're currently pregnant, we're going to take the case. We're just going to confirm that they haven't had any complications. Uh, but it's important for you to list that on the application, no, no complications. Uh, and then also what their pre-pregnancy weight is and how far along they are with their pregnancy. The, the reason I want those ad two additional items, and that's where you, you as a, the, the, under, or the field underwriter, the agent, can help us immensely, is we're going to take a look at, for the weight, for example, the pre-pregnancy weight. Obviously, they're going to gain a lot of weight uh, with, with pregnancy, and we, don't want, we want to know what they are beforehand and use that weight when we determine the, the preferred and super preferred premium classes. So we, uh, we don't want to hold the, the weight gain against them there. The other item is, uh, just as important, is during pregnancy, a lot of their lab values can be altered for uh, due strictly due to the pregnancy. If you have a female in that last trimester, you could have their cholesterol quite high, but it's really not significant, and it's caused solely by the fact that they're pregnant or there's a whole host of other tests that we run that can be adversely impacted by their, their pregnancy. And if I, if I know they're pregnant, if I know how long, how far they, they are along, that'll help me gauge the significance of those blood test results. So that stuff is uh, real, real critical for us. Roger, do you look at somebody um, with some labs that might not be within normal limits in that case? Um, do you look at their pre-pregnancy labs or maybe their, preg their labs from when they were first? Um, yeah, uh, we, we, do, we do if they're available. Uh, the, the item is, you know, I mean, most people that, are, that are, are, are pregnant are, you know, what, 20s and 30s. Uh, so they don't all, often have a whole lot of medical records or things that potentially could be impacted there. So we have a pretty good idea of, of of what, what's reasonable or what reasonably uh, is, is to expect given the fact that they're, say, eight months pregnant. So we, we can make some adjustments internally uh, with those lab values to, to see. Now, if there's, when in doubt, yeah, we'd want to get their medical records and look back at the trends and see where they, where they were before they were pregnant. And sometimes we get good right. information, sometimes not. And I can tell you, if they are having any uh, pregnancy complications, we, we do postpone until after pregnancy. And usually, we like to wait, uh, you know, two to three months after after the delivery, and then we can consider them. 
Great. Roger, we're kind of running short on time here, so just a couple other ones that I really sure. want to touch on. Um, that anxiety and depression um, is yes. one we get a lot of. Yeah, uh, I'll give you kind of a rapid uh, uh, session of the, uh, our takes on the different mental health type things. Uh, with depression, the majority of people that are uh, being treated for depression, they're going to go into the standard premium class. Uh, we don't uh, allow preferred, but standard, yes, and, and most of them are not uh, rated. We generally are going to get their medical records. Now, if you do come across something called bipolar, which is, of course, a type of depression that's more significant, if they're bipolar, generally a rating is going to be needed. But depression, generally standard. Anxiety, while often people have de depression and anxiety, they are quite different with anxiety. Uh, if there, as long as it's well controlled and not any significant life interference, uh, we can even go into the preferred non-tobacco and preferred tobacco premium classes. So anxiety, uh, potentially preferred. Uh, Post-traumatic stress disorder, if they're being treated uh, generally standard, uh, can be rated depending on how well controlled it is and things. If uh, people are, uh, we see this a lot, if they're on medications for sleep, uh, that's, that's fine. Just tell us you know, that they're on this medication for sleep, and that, that's fine. That should not adversely impact their, uh, their mortality. So you make a, give us a good description of, of really what you're dealing with there or what they have, the treatment, uh, and, and how it works, and, and that will help us speed along the, uh, the, the underwriting, underwriting process. Uh, you know, underwriters don't like to order medical records. Uh, you guys don't like to see us do it. We don't like to, to do it either. Uh, APSs are very time consuming uh, for the underwriter to review. It probably takes an average of a half hour to 45 minutes to review uh, the medical records. And that's, that's probably the least favorite part of uh, all underwriters' jobs is looking at medical records. Like I said, we, we try to keep them down to a minimum. And, and, that can, and you guys can impact that uh, by giving great information on the application. So um, a lot of anxiety and depression meds can be used for either or. So basically, as long as agents are clarifying, you know, my, I have my client take this drug, but it's classified as a depression drug, but they take it for anxiety or vice versa. So just indicate that on the application, and that should help you. Right. You're 100% you're correct. A lot of those medications re really overlap. Probably 90% of them uh, overlap. They can be used for anxiety or depression and so based off that medication I don't know what they have but I can tell you that somebody's you know why, why they're taking Respidol uh, or different medications and, and used to key treat some of the more significant ones uh, types of mental health issues but with anxiety depression uh, the majority of those medications can be used for both so given a good description is, is, is critical because like I said how we're going to handle that case uh, can be quite different with anxiety you know, often we, we will get the, the medical records, but if it's well controlled, I, you know, preferred is, is definitely uh, on the table there. Great. Well, one other big one I want to cover before we run out of time is coronary artery disease. Well, that's, uh, that's one of the more interesting ones that we see on a, on a routine basis. You know, if, if they have coronary artery disease, some degree of rating is going to be needed. Now that can be all the way from two tables to decline. I can tell you the more vessels involved, the younger the applicant, uh, the higher the rating. Uh, the more damage done to the heart, the higher the rating. You know, if they're able to do, uh, uh, you know, uh, some type of surgery in advance of a heart attack, that's always uh, better than if they have a heart attack because there's potentially heart damage done. So we're going to look, look uh, uh, you know, how have they done? You know, when was it found? How was it found? How much vessels were involved? Any damage done to the heart? And then also look very closely at their compliance with treatment. Some people even, e even after a heart attack, don't do what their doctors tell them to or don't take their medications as needed. Those are all risk factors that uh, greatly increase their mortality. The other thing we look very closely at is uh, other comorbid comorbidity factors. For example, yes, the guy has heart disease, but is he also diabetic? Is he overweight? 
or does, did he continue to uh, smoke cigarettes? That is a, is a, a huge issue. Surprisingly, you see a lot of people, they don't give up cigarettes even after their bypass or heart attack. It's kind of like putting gas on a fire. It's going to speed along the progression of it. So the comorbidity factors are definitely going to uh, raise the risk if, if they're present. And we'll look at those, and those people uh, are definitely going to get a higher rate than others. You always like heart disease to show itself uh, as late in life as possible because it is a you know pro generally progressive disease with with people. So a person in his uh, you know early 40s and somebody in their uh, late 60s could get quite different offers. Right. Well, I get one last thing, Roger. Sure. Do you does North American have a sweet spot in underwriting that you know these are your your clients that fit best for you? Yeah. Well, you know, our, our, our sweet spot is, is really those cases, and, and these are uh, files that we're going to be able to give you the, uh, that we feel we can give you the best uh, time service on, uh, and of the most competitive offers. And it, it really goes up, you know, up to that five, uh, five million, preferably two, uh, up to age 70 and, and four tables or, or better. You know, that's the spot that uh, we're going to be able to, to shine and do our best on. We're certainly going to look at those other cases, the larger face amounts, the, the higher rated risk cases, but that's not going to be our forte. Uh, we're not a, a you know, substandard company uh, you know, looking for those people that are you know, six, eight, ten tables, uh, thinking that we know more than the rest of the industry about heart disease or diabetes. But we're going to come back with a very fair uh, offer to the person that uh, should be hopefully placeable by you. And that risk is really going to reflect the, the risk that that person poses to us uh, and, and their true mortality. So we're going to apply a real common sense approach uh, to the underwriting, uh, both with the underwriting uh, process of, of getting, the, uh, getting the evidence of insurability, but also with determining that, uh, that, that underwriting offer. So it's really a common sense approach. Uh, you've got contact right with the underwriter that made the decision, which is, which is great. So we can provide uh, you know your MGA more information if needed about the decision. So it's really a, a you know common sense approach uh, to that decision process, and, and that's both has worked well for us. Good, good. Well, we find it very easy to work with North American, and uh, thank you very much for your time today. And if anybody has any questions? I don't see any questions out here right now, but if you think of something that you uh, didn't think of while we were on the call this morning, please don't hesitate to reach out to one of the life marketers here at Premier. Our number here is 800-365-8208, and uh, we can definitely get those answers for you. Uh, we do work very closely with North American. If you've got uh, tough cases that you're not sure of how the underwriting would go, by all means, get us the information. We'll find out for you. Uh, thanks again, Roger and Brandon, for your time this morning and everyone else, and I hope you all have a great day. All right. Nice talking with you guys today. Take care. Thanks. Everyone have a good day.